This video is going to be looking at cellular respiration in detail. If you have not yet viewed the cellular respiration overview video, you may want to do so now. The process of glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell, so it's outside the mitochondria. This is an anaerobic process because it does not require oxygen. The first step of glycolysis is to split the glucose into two three-carbon molecules. So we're looking at these guys right here, not the pyruvate. So these are actually something different. Glycolysis itself is actually several steps long, about 12 steps. And so we are looking at a pretty simplified version of glycolysis. So the first thing that's going to happen is that we're actually going to spend two AT molecules, and that's going to allow this first step to occur. The second step is that some electrons are going to be taken from these three carbon molecules and they're going to be loaded up onto NAD, which is going to form NADH. Remember that NADH is the electron carrier that contains those two extra electrons. This second part is also going to pr uh, produce four ATP molecules here. So remember that earlier we spent two ATP molecules in this initial step, and now we're gaining four ATP molecules. So what we say is that the net gain of ATP molecules here is just two. So in glycolysis, we saw just a small amount of ATP being made. We saw our two pyruvate molecules being made, and we also saw NADH getting made um, full of electrons, and it's going to head to this last step. Now let's look at the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle, um, the main function is to actually transfer electrons from the pyruvate, or we're going to see it's actually going to change into something else before it enters Krebs, but it's going to extract those electrons and transfer them to NAD and FAD, and that's going to form our high energy electron carriers, which are also going to head over to this last step. So we're going to go through the Krebs cycle step by step, starting with step one. And step one is over here. We're going to see that that three carbon molecule pyruvate, notice it's just one of them, but we produced two from um, glycolysis. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to rip off one of those carbons in the form of carbon dioxide. And you can see right here that there's one um, of the carbon dioxide molecules that's being released in this process. Now that we're down to a two carbon molecule, this guy right here is referred to as acetyl. Also in this process, we can see that some electrons are being um, transferred over to NAD, which is forming NADH. Step two of the Krebs cycle is that we're going to combine a uh, molecule called coenzyme A onto this two carbon acetyl group. So if you remember from our last slide, this two carbon group was called acetyl. And what's going to happen is CoA is going to join onto it literally just to get it into the Krebs cycle, and then it's going to leave. So you can think of coenzyme A as being kind of like a helper. Its literal job is just to get these two carbon atoms into the Krebs cycle. In fact, you can kind of keep track of the carbon atoms here. You can see that there's two right here from acetyl. There's four from um, the last step of the Kre uh, Krebs cycle, and so we're combining two plus these four to get a total of six carbons right here, which is actually part of our step three. So step three is that that two carbon um, part called acetyl is going to join into the Krebs cycle using coenzyme A as a helper. Coenzyme A is going to leave and go back to step two, and these two carbon atoms are going to combine with these four carbon atoms to make a total of six carbon atoms. This is called citric acid, this point in the Krebs cycle. It's the first molecule of the Krebs cycle, and this is why the Krebs cycle is now um, more so being called the citric acid cycle. So the citric acid uh, molecule is going to get broken down, and you can see that there is a release of carbon dioxide right here. So that's the second carbon dioxide we've seen released. There was the first one over here in step one. Also what we're seeing is that some of the electrons um, from that step are going to be loaded up onto NAD, and we get NADH. This is also the second time we're seeing NADH being formed. It was also formed over here at step one. So, so far that's two NADHs that are being loaded up with electrons. In step five, we're going to see another carbon dioxide um, uh, get released, and so that's the third and the final carbon dioxide from the Krebs cycle that gets released. So now we're back down to a four-carbon molecule. 
Notice too that that's going to be one, two, three total carbon dioxide molecules. But remember that we started initially with one pyruvate. And back in glycolysis, we produced two of those molecules. So actually, the Krebs cycle can turn twice per every glucose molecule. And that's where we would get the total of six carbon dioxides because we have three being released from each turn and it can turn twice. So also over here at step five, we are forming some more NADH. We're also forming one molecule of ATP. Um, and in the total, we're going to end up producing two molecules of ATP since we can do two turns of the Krebs cycle. In step six, um, we're rearranging these, um, this four carbon molecule into another four carbon molecule. And in doing so, we're able to extract more electrons from there and we're able to produce both NADH and FADH2. That four carbon molecule is gonna remain in the cycle so that it can catch the next acetyl-CoA coming into the cycle. So glycolysis produced two pyruvate molecules, and so the Krebs cycle can turn two times per glucose molecule, so that's why we get a total of two ATP molecules made in the Krebs cycle, even though we're only seeing one right here. So now we're going to look at oxidative phosphorylation, and this consists of two components we have already seen in um, photosynthesis. It's going to consist of the electron transport chain, or the ETC, and chemiosmosis. Both of these take place in and across the inner membrane of the mitochondrion, and this is what's going to produce the most ATP out of this whole process. It's also important to note what glycolysis and the Krebs cycle have been doing for this last step. In addition to the small amounts of ATP that they've made, what they've mostly been doing is producing these high energy electron carriers, which are shuttling electrons over to this last step. So we're going to look through each um, each part of the uh, oxidative phosphorylation now. So this picture hopefully looks familiar. It looks somewhat like what we saw with the light dependent reactions in photosynthesis, except this time we are in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. That's what all of this represents. Um, below, the yellow part represents the matrix of the mitochondria, and up here represents what we would call the intermembrane space, or the sp space between the membranes. Not shown in this picture would be the outer membrane, but it would be like up here somewhere. So the first thing that's going to happen is that proteins um, in the um, inner membrane are going to allow these high energy molecules, NADH and FADH2, to drop off their electrons into the electron transport chain. So that's what all of this is representing right here, where you can kind of see this darker box. That is an electron transport chain, just like the one that we saw in um, photosynthesis. These NADH and FADH2 molecules came from the Krebs cycle and glycolysis. That was why both of those things happened, it was so that we could get electrons to do this next process. So step two is that high energy electrons are going to travel through the proteins in the electron transport chain. Just like we saw in photosynthesis, this is going to provide energy for active transport to occur. What's going to happen is that hydrogen ions are going to get pumped from a, um, an area of low concentration down here in the matrix to a high concentration up here in the intermembrane space. So this is producing that chemiosmotic gradient, just like we saw in photosynthesis, where we have hydrogen hydrogen ions built up in the intermembrane space, and we have a high concentration here and a low concentration occurring in the matrix. Step three is occurring over here, and hydrogen ions are going to diffuse through a protein channel. This is part of um, ATP synthase, just like we saw in photosynthesis. And what ATP synthase is going to do is it's going to phosphorylate ADP and make ATP. Step four is occurring down over here. As the electrons from our shuttles make their way through the electron transport chain and out the other side, they're going to get picked up by oxygen gas. This right here, that oxygen, O2, right there that I am circling, this is the reason that we breathe in oxygen gas is so this process can happen. Oxygen is a highly electronegative element, which means that it's literally acting like an electron magnet and pulling these electrons through the electron transport chain. This is what we call the final electron acceptor because it is there to accept the electrons as well as some hydrogen ions, and it's going to become water, which is why water is a byproduct of um, cellular respiration. 
So if you've been keeping track of ATP molecules, here's a breakdown of everything. Glycolysis produces two ATP molecules. Remember, we had to spend two, but we got four, so a net gain of two ATP molecules. Um, we also got two ATP from the Krebs cycle, and we get up to 34 from oxidative phosphorylation. So that's a total of up to 38 ATP molecules. A lot of times, too, in textbooks, we'll see a range from 36 to 38 ATP molecules per glucose molecule. This next part is just an overview of cellular respiration, and I'm basically just going to pause each slide for just a couple seconds, and if you want to stop and um, pause your video, you can sit there and look at each slide individually. A quick correction in this slide, that should say hydrogen ions are pumped across the membrane from low to high against their concentration gradient. That is active transport. <laughs> 